Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Well, good morning. Uh, man, it's good to be back with you guys. I missed y'all. I've only been gone a week, but it feels good to be back. I'm Joel. I'm the teaching guy here, and we're going to continue our series today called Not This Again, where we talk about relational patterns, where you find yourself going, oh, here we go again with this. Every time with my son or my daughter or my husband or my wife, not this again. But before we jump into it, I want to say something real quick. Last week, I was at Lakewood Church. I was the host for a missions conference they have, their huge missions conference they do every year. And I don't know if you heard, but in the news, two weeks ago, they had a shooting, an attempted shooting at Lakewood. And thanks to the response of their security team, it miraculously, 60 shots were fired off from an automatic weapon. No one but the shooter died at that church. And it was thanks to the security team who took their calling of security very importantly. And I want to let you guys know, you probably don't notice them a lot, but we have a security team here doing that same thing. And I just want to give, I want to thank them. It really is a calling. And uh, man, I love, Joe, Joe's in charge of our security today. And he was talking about, he's like, I just, we just drive into and like, our, this is our calling to protect the flock of God right here. And uh, we're just so grateful for those guys that take that so seriously that they would put themselves in harm's way uh, to protect all of us. So thanks, security team. Y'all are doing a great job. It's one of those things where they train and they practice. And they do train, by the way. They train and they train, hopefully never have to use it. But man, when the time comes, we want people that are quick response. So, all right. Y'all ready for this? So first, I want to get an elephant out of the room. Uh, this, all my face is kind of beat up, right? Did you? I don't know if you noticed that, but I just got to say you should see the other guy. But uh, no, I'm just kidding. That's not what happened. But uh, I, uh, I went to the doctor this week, the skin doctor, and um, he said, hey, there's some things on your face that are concerned. I'm just going to burn them off, given your history. I hate it when they say that. So y'all know a couple of years ago, I had this melanoma thing on my side here, not to flash y'all, but, uh, and they had to cut it out and I uh, left a scar here. And anyways, miraculously, when they got in there, they didn't find any melanoma. The Lord had healed me. But uh, I said that very passionately. The Lord had healed me. There we go. That's the right way to say that. Yeah. Uh, but it drives me crazy when he's like, well, given your history, I think we need to, because I hate that. Given your history. I'm like, don't talk. My history, it's not a history, that was a one-time, like that was a one-off thing. I don't believe that's going to happen again, right? And how many of us in our lives, we get labeled by our history, yes. and we go, no, I know, that was, that, you're, you're, you're identifying me by my worst season, but that's not me anymore. I'm, I've changed, that's not me. There's this element, you know, your history does not define your destiny, and a lot of us We've been told that it does define your destiny, but, but here's, here's the important thing to recognize. Your history doesn't define your destiny, but your history does impact you, and you need to recognize what that history has done to the way you see the world, the ears you see, hear the world through, the eyes you see the world through. We've all got these lenses we see the world through, and we've all got these kind of almost hearing aids, how we process the world. And what can happen is, given our history... If we don't do some reprogramming, sometimes some things from our past can really impact the way we see the world, and it can actually limit us in our relationships if we're holding on to things from the past that we didn't realize were impacting us. And I think one of the biggest things that happens in relationships is disappointment creeps in, and it starts to impact the way we see people around us. Disappointment shows up in all sorts of ways, but what can happen is, I mean, you, maybe disappointment happens in your relationship where you're just disappointed with who you ended up marrying. But you're not going to say that out loud. I had a lady one time, she came up to me and she's like, I just realized something as you were preaching about disappointed. I've been disappointed in my marriage for 20 years, but I didn't want to say it out loud. But she said, but it's been impacting my marriage in all sorts of weird ways and I didn't even realize it. So I started thinking like, we don't sit around thinking about how disappointed we are. It's not like some, some people do, but most people just go, eh, well, this is just life. But if you don't recognize disappointment for what it is, it can come out in all sorts of weird ways. So I wanted to look, first of all, before we start, start talking about disappointment, I want to look at some of the ways that disappointment shows up in our lives, and we may not even realize it. I think one of the first ones is in anger. 
Uh, for years, uh, right, several years ago, excuse me, um, my, my dad and I, we played on a church softball team from our church. Our church was called Faith Temple. And it was all church league. And there was this group of guys in this church league. And they had some bizarre name. It wasn't related to a church. They were like Disciples in Christ Saved or something like that, right? D-I-C, wait, hold, no, wait. anyway, they were like, they were mean. They weren't from any church. You'd ask them, what church are you from? And they go, oh, you know, it's a, it's a church across town. I'm like, well, who's the pastor? Oh, I'm like, you're not from a church. And they would trash talk like nobody's business. I mean, they would be like, I had one time I was playing third, and this guy rounded the corner. And he's like, hey, your wife says hi. I was just with her. And I'm like, shut up, dude. Like, <laughs> this is a church league. And these guys would use profanity. And the refs would always have to be like, you can't use the F-bomb in a church league. You know, like that. And these guys were absolutely horrible, and we realized, but they dominated on the softball field. Nobody could beat them, the disciples in Christ saved. And, <laughs> one day we showed up to the softball field, and they, all the games had been canceled because there had been a bench-clearing brawl in the church league. And guess who started it? The disciples in Christ saved. I concluded this about these guys. All these guys, they were really successful businessmen. They owned businesses. Some of them were CEOs in the town. But I concluded these were guys who were very disappointed about how their sports career turned out. They were like Uncle Rico from Napoleon Dynamite. Back in 82, they could throw a football over those fields. And now they're like living out their fantasies of being some sports hero in a church league. And they just played angry all the time. I'm like, guys, this is, it's a fun softball game. But these guys were angry. They're like, we must dominate. And I've seen a lot of times disappointment shows up as anger, particularly in men. A lot of times men, we set goals for ourselves. If you're an ambitious type A type, maybe in your eight you know, right out of high school or in your 20s, you set some goals for yourself. You say, man, by the time I'm 40, I'll have accomplished this. I'll make my first million. I'll have a business. We'll own the house, whatever it is. And then what happens is, as you get older, like new values have shown up. So like kids came into the picture and you got married and you actually discovered that they're not going to pay you quite what you think you're worth. And you're hitting, getting close to 40 and you're starting to feel just increasingly angry because you're holding yourself to goals you set for yourself in your 20s before you had, a new, before you had everything in place, before you really even knew who you were. Yeah. And you've been pushing yourself, and you're just angry all the time because you're going, this isn't, this isn't what it was supposed to look like, and these people are getting in the way of what I was trying to accomplish. Now, let me just really make a really important point. If your family is ever getting in the way of your goals, your goals are screwed up. I'll leave that there. But a lot of guys, they get angry. And this is where guys flip out in midlife. They look around, and they're just so frustrated and angry, and there's this low-grade anger they're always just walking around with. And listen, I'm not preaching at you. I relate to this, this low-grade anger. It's just kind of like sitting below the surface, and one thing goes wrong. You can't get that car door to close, you know, and you're just like... And it just erupts, and you're kind of concerned about it because you're like, whoa, I shouldn't have gotten that angry at that. But it's, it's because a lot of disappointments have been building up, and you've maybe never acknowledged them because who wants to sit around thinking you're disappointed in life? But it's been building up, and you're just angry all the time. And it's not like you're beating people or hitting people, but it's just you feel this within you all the time. A lot of people drive angry. Have you noticed that? Some of y'all out there, you drive angry, and it's because you're disappointed. Disappointment comes out in anger a lot of times. Another way it comes out is in anxiety. You know, men, they deal with the anger generally. Now, I've dealt with a lot of anxiety, but I usually turn it into anger because, guys, we have, like, two emotions, right? One emotion is angry and the other is asleep. But it's <laughs> anxiety is another way it comes out, and that tends to show up a lot of times more in women. And women, I've noticed, guys have their midlife crisis in their mid-40s. Women tend to have it in their, in their 30s, and I think that's because they're Smarter than guys. And they pick up on what's going on a little earlier than guys. But usually, I've seen over and over again, when I talk to a woman who's kind of in a crisis, it's usually she's in her mid-30s, and she's looking around, and she's having tremendous amounts of anxiety. And she's realizing, she's going, this is my life. And I don't know if I like this. And you're realizing, this is, is this as good as it gets? I didn't think, it, I thought my husband would be different than this by now. I thought he was going to change. And there's this anxiety that starts to well up within them. 
And a lot of times it's because it just, you, you wake up and you go, it wasn't supposed to look this way. My marriage wasn't supposed to look this way. Caring for kids wasn't supposed to look this way. Man, I was following that lady on Instagram and she always had her kids clean and everything was good. And, and, then, and she had three businesses on the side and sold essential oils and all of her, and her seven kids were all like in a row with clothes she made. And <laughs> it wasn't supposed to. And you're looking around at your house and going, it's just, you know, your house. And you're like, this, this wasn't supposed to look like this. And you're disappointed because you had this idea in your mind of what it was supposed to look like, and it didn't turn out that way, and it shows up as anxiety, and you're just riddled with this fear, and what if it doesn't get any better than this? Another way it shows up is in apathy. I didn't mean to make all these with A's, but it worked out well. Apathy is just kind of, what's it matter anyway? What does it matter? Like, I'm never going to get ahead. Every time I try and get ahead, every time we try and get out of debt, something major breaks. We have to replace the transmission on the car. Washing machine breaks. One week, one month, we're going to try and get ahead. And we can never even have a month where we're in the black. We're always going in the hole and having to put it on the credit card. And you just, what's the point? What's the point of even being responsible? A lot of times you just check out. Maybe some people you check out with alcohol, others with drugs. Some people check out binge watching Netflix. You just go, I just want to. Just shut out the world. It's just, what's it matter? Who cares? What's the point of trying to get ahead? I can't get ahead no matter what I do. And a lot of it is because a series of disappointments. Things didn't turn out in the past the way you thought it should. And these show up in our relationships too. Anger, relationships. You know. You live with that person. You know what anger looks like in the relationships. Anxiety, constant fear, walking around on eggshells in your own home. Going, man, if I, I know we don't, I don't want to bring this up. This is becoming a real problem, but I don't want to talk to him about it because it's going to blow up into a fight or her. I'm not going to talk to her about it. Another way it shows up is apathy. You're just kind of living under the same roof, raising the kids and going, there's no point. This marriage can't get better. I just, we've tried. It's not going to happen. So what's the point? And you're just like, well, we'll just maybe try and stay together till the kids go off to wherever they go off to, get out of the house. Anybody relate to this? I believe it's all disappointment. And I think oftentimes when you get in these situations, if you're really honest about it, your disappointment is maybe in some ways leveled at God. Because often, you know, we really believe God is all-powerful, and a lot of times we go, well, God, you could have kept that from happening this way. You could have changed this for me, but you didn't. You could have healed her, but she died. And disappointment starts to set in, and oftentimes we project that disappointment. We don't even put it on people. We put it on God. A.W. Tozer, he said, what comes to mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. And if you've got some bad views on God, it can be projected onto those around you in your relationships. And oftentimes, God will feel like he's disappointing you. If you've ever felt like you've been disappointed, specifically disappointed with God, you're in good company. Because there was a guy named John the Baptist who actually had a very disappointing moment with his cousin. John the Baptist was the cousin of Jesus. This guy, they're sangre, they're blood, man. (laughs) And there's this moment where John the Baptist, he's, he's doing his thing, he's baptizing people, and Jesus comes, and all of a sudden, John has this realization. He says, guys, the Savior our country, our people have been looking for He is right there. That's the dude. The Savior is here. He's coming to change everything. They had been under Roman oppression for years. They were being persecuted. They were just, it was really, really bad. And they're like, John goes, that's the Savior. He's here. The guy I've been prophesying about and living out here and eating locusts and living in camel hair to tell you about, he's here. And he comes down and Jesus says, you need to baptize me, John. He's like, cuz, I can't baptize you like You need to baptize me. And Jesus says, no, you need to baptize me. So John baptizes Jesus. And as Jesus is coming up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord comes down, and there's this voice that says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Can you imagine living that moment? You're like, oh, it's about to get really good. (laughs) Like, it's about to get really good. I, I didn't wear this camel hair and eat locusts for nothing. It's about to be really good. Jesus is about to throw down 
Cuz is coming in and he's going to tear this place up and set up the kingdom. And a few months later, John gets thrown in prison. So John gets a little upset. He's like, Jesus, you're just, I mean, I've been, I've been to Israel. Like the whole country, it's like 100 miles long. So Jesus at any point was in two days, three days walk of where John was. So I'm sure he's thinking Jesus is going to come kick the gates in and be like, I'm here. I'm here to save you, John. But nothing happens. John's languishing in this crummy prison. So he calls his disciples. And he said, he sent them to the Lord saying, hey, look, Jesus, cuz, are you the one who's to come? Or should we be looking for somebody else? And when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you saying, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? In that moment, or in that hour, Jesus healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits. And on many who were blind, he bestowed sight. And he answered them, go tell John what you've seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them. He doesn't even answer John's question, does he? Doesn't say it, he says this. But then he says this, he closes by saying this. And blessed is the one who's not offended by me. That's not a good answer to me. I'd be like, yeah, but what else did he say? If I'm in prison? Did he say he's going to deliver me? He said, he just healed a bunch of people. He made people see. And, and he said, blessed are those who aren't offended by me. I think this is a huge, huge truth. Because what I think Jesus is saying to John is say, John, look, it is so easy for you to get focused on your specific problem. But I'm working on something way bigger here i'm working on the salvation of the world and it's so easy for us to get so narrowly focused on the small things in life that we shut out everything else when i was a kid we used to get take these toilet paper rolls and we would pretend they're binoculars and they put them over our eyes like oh look you know i'm on my ship but you know those those uh toilet paper rolls didn't really do anything to magnify increase the situation because there were no lenses in it. What they really did is they just blocked out my view of everything around me. And I think what happens in life a lot of times is we have these things basically they're kind of toilet paper rolls that we end up putting over our eyes and we say I got to have that over there. That's what the good life looks like. Until I have that, nothing will be good. And when that doesn't happen, we get upset. We go, it, it's supposed to be this way. And Jesus is like, hey, uh, I'm working on something way bigger. And we get offended when he doesn't come through on the thing we thought we needed. My friend James, he used to say it this way. He used to say, God always heals, but he often doesn't heal the thing we want healed. He heals what keeps us from loving him fully. A lot of times we think, man, God, if you could just take this away, if you could get rid of this for me, man, it could take care of everything. But that's maybe not what God knows you need to get where you want to go. And if we're not careful, our disappointments about what should have been can hinder us and we can go, man, God, it was supposed to be this way and you let me down. My kid was supposed to be perfect. I did all the things right and then she just ran off and acted like, I mean, whose kid is this? What is, what is this? You could have done something about it, God. And then we get mad at our kid for not being what we wanted them to be. We get mad at God, and we just walk around with this anger, this anxiety. Maybe it's apathy. So there's this story where Job, Job is a book of the Bible I don't really like. Uh, it's probably the oldest book of the Bible, which says a lot about man's struggle with God. There's this Job, and he's living a perfect life. He's doing it everything right. And what ends up happening is, Satan comes, and I, this, the whole book makes me very uncomfortable, okay? I wish it wasn't in there, but it is. Satan comes to God and says, hey, your boy Job, you know, the only reason he serves you is because you give him everything he wants. And he's like, all right, we'll take all of his stuff. Satan, in one night, takes all of Job's stuff, his kids, barns, houses, everything. It's destroyed. But Job doesn't turn his back on God. So Satan comes and he goes, well, the reason he has turned his back, hasn't turned his back on you Again, theologically, this book makes me very uncomfortable. I do not like this book, but it's in there. The only reason he hasn't turned his back on you, God, is because you haven't let me hurt him. Let me hurt him. And God's like, my boy Job, he ain't going to flounder. Go for it. 
but you can only do so much. So he puts these horrible boils all over Job, and Job's life just gets, he gets sick, and he's miserable. And he's sitting there, and he's in, and he's in the ashes complaining about life, and, uh, and all of his friends come, and they tell him. One of his friends says, well, you know, the reason this has happened to you is because you're in sin. And Job's like, I don't think I'm in sin. You know, there's wonderful friends you have that give you horrible advice. <laughs> in the end, here's what happens at the end of the book. The Lord answered Job, finally. Job's like, God, why, why, why? The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? And then he says, dress for action like a man, because I'm going to start asking you some questions. He says, put on your big boy pants. I'm about to ask you some questions. And then he asks Job, where were you when the foundations of the world were created? Where were you when I established Leviathan? Where were you when I tore down this and built up this? And this is how it ends. Job, in the end, answered the Lord and said, Oh, I know that you can do all things, and the no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Here, I, there it is. Yeah, here and I will speak. I will question you and, and make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself and I repent. I turn from what I thought had to be. Repent literally means turn and change directions. It says, I repent in dust and ashes. And I think, man, I think that message for us is this. In our relationships, there are going to be times where things just aren't what they should have been and we thought they should have been. But if you will trust God to do what only he can do in your relationships, even if it doesn't look like it should have, even if your marriage isn't what you thought it should have been, even if your spouse hasn't turned into the knight in shining armor you thought he would have been. I had a lady one time, she came to me and she said, you know, I realize I'm disappointed. I just knew God was going to convert my, uh, through my example, my, my husband was going to be converted to Christianity and it's been 30 years and he still hasn't converted. She said, but I, you know what? I've decided I'm going to let it go. And I, and I told her, you know what? You're probably going to be able to love him for the first time ever as for who he is, not for what you want him to be. And I think that's the message here from this book. He said, look, God is working all things, but he's working all things. And you're focused on your one thing. And you've got all these experiences of not getting that one thing you thought you should have and the thing you needed. But if you'll trust God that he knows what you actually need, he will actually provide for you. And you don't, you don't define your future based on the past. You define your future not, not based on disappointments. You define it based on what God is able to do. That's what Job says. I know you can do all things. So I'm not going to let past disappointments taint the way I see the future. I'm going to trust that you're going to do exactly what you need to do, and I'm going to trust that what you need to do is actually going to work out really good for me, even if it means taking the blinders off and it not being what I wanted it to be. You guys receive that? Yes. All right. Lord, we thank you so much that you work all things. You are all powerful. You accomplish your purposes, and nobody can stop it. And blessed are those who aren't offended by your ways. So, Lord, we surrender today. We surrender what, we, what should have been, what we thought you should have done. And we say, Lord, have your way. We trust you in our relationships, Lord. It's all you. We give it to you. If you're here this morning and you have not given your life to Jesus, that is the first step. You need to get on the road to victory. You need to get those, the, the sin problem that you have taken care of. I'm going to say a prayer in just a second. And if you say this prayer and you mean it in your heart, God is going to come. He's going to forgive all of your sins. He's going to turn you to a new direction, point you in a new direction. That's what repent means. He's going to forgive you and set you up in an eternal address with him. It starts when we say this prayer. Let's all say it together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way and we turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. In your name, amen. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.